Hello all and welcome to Wake Up With Marcy. It's time to heal, transform, and be inspired. Today we're going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis and how we can identify fears and push through them. We first meet Daniel Collins, an American professional tennis player. Danielle is speaking about the pressures of the sport, her rheumatoid arthritis, and how she has dealt with the pressures of the sport and how she can help us to rethink failure. We then meet Monica Berg, international speaker and spiritual thought leader. She is also the author of Fear Is Not An Option and We Think Love. She shares with us three types of fear, how to identify them and work through them. Hi, Danielle. Welcome to Wake Up with Marcy. Hi, thank you for having me. It's awesome to have you. And you have you are now back in Florida after the US Open, huh? That's right. I'm uh, getting some time to spend at home and it's been nice. I was on the road for two months. So yeah, just happy to be back and, and yeah. be able to get some training in and be able to relax too and see some family. Yes, I'm glad you're getting some time to relax because I'm sure heading into the U.S. Open, there was no relaxing for you. No, no, it was, um, it was so different, you know, with everything COVID related, um, being in the bubble, all of the social distancing practices and, and wearing the masks pretty much everywhere we went. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the new normal. Hopefully we can yeah. go back to what we used to, to be used to, but um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of an adjustment on my end and something that I don't think any of us, um, you know, had experienced, um, with, you know, at least since the tournaments have started up again. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was happy to go out and play and to be able to have the opportunity to play at the U S open. Cause I think earlier in the year, there was a lot of fear that we wouldn't be able to have sporting events the rest of the year. So right. it, really but it wouldn't even event. happen. Exactly. Yeah. It was nice that they were able to make it happen and, and, um, yeah. give us the opportunity because I think all of us had kind of gotten tired of training for eight months. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I just, congratulations on that. And I want to talk about what, you know, rewind, go to your childhood. And it's always fascinating to find out if, if tennis was like your sport from your childhood. Did you always know this was your sport? Yeah, when I was younger, I tried a bunch of different sports, but tennis was really the only one that clicked with me. Um, my dad played recreationally. Um, my mom wasn't much of an athlete. She's a school teacher, so she kind of prioritized the academics more. Uh -huh. But I tried swimming, I tried soccer, I tried gymnastics, I did dance for a little while, and none of those really seemed to click. And then once I became intrigued with tennis, that's when I realized my love for competing and, and wanting to um, eventually be a professional, but I also had, you know, aspirations of going to college. So that right. um, tennis really opened up a lot of doors for me. That's fantastic. So it was your passion, not necessarily your parents pushing you to do it. I don't think so. I mean, I, I do think there were days that were, that were hard, just like with anything. I think as adults, you know, sometimes we don't like our jobs or we don't want to go into the office or I don't, yeah. you know, always want to go out on the tennis court, to be honest. But um, I think that's when you kind of need a parent to be able to say, look, this is something that you're really talented at. You've worked so hard at and you need to keep going. So I think they definitely gave me a healthy push. Um, yeah. But I think most of my passion and the hard work came from me and me That's wanting to do it because I was so in love with the game. So how did you deal with uh, the mental and physical part of the sport? Yeah, you know, I think the nice thing about when you're, when you're a kid is that, especially when you start really young, is you actually don't, I think for a lot of kids, you don't have that fear when you start at like six and seven. Because right. you just go out and you do what you want to do and you don't really think about what other people think about you or have the, you know, 
burden on your shoulders of, of those types of, you know, expectations that maybe you think other people have about you. So mm -hmm. um, I think that helps starting at a young age because I see where sometimes when kids start sports a little bit later in their childhood, it's more of an uncomfortable start because they're kind of going through other things in their life with um, school and, and kids and peer pressure. And, and, and also I think when you're playing on a team sport, there is that, that sense of, okay, I want to do my best. And if I don't do my best, I'm going to be embarrassed. Yeah. So I think with tennis being an individual sport, I really only had to worry about myself. So if I lost, you know, it was my fault and that, that hurt sometimes, but I didn't have teammates watching me or putting pressure on me or, um, you know, a handful of coaches that I was working with that would be like, come on, you got to do better. It's kind of just yeah. on me. Uh, yeah. So that's a nice thing about the individual sport is you don't have to deal with all of the other outside noise. Um, but I think when you start transitioning into college and, and then you're on a team and then playing professionally, those things become a little bit more real. What could you say to maybe a parent that wants this for their child, but maybe the child doesn't want it so much? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy for parents to kind of look at a success story like the Williams sisters, for example, and how hard um, Richard Williams worked with his daughters to get with to get where they are at today. And, and I think people are really inspired by that, which is great. But I think you also have to be realistic. Venus and Serena are two of the greatest athletes of all time. And not everybody is meant to be the greatest athlete of all time. And I think it's great to work hard at things. I think it's great to be inspired. But I also think that it's important to be realistic because, you know, my parents, they actually, when I got older, didn't want me to play professionally. They kind of tried to drift me away from that after college. And now I understand why. Um, I love what I do, but it's not an easy life. And yeah. the things that we endure mentally, physically, the expectations of other people, the media, it's, it's not an easy lifestyle. And, you know, I think a lot of parents push their kids as far as they can. And, you know, in tennis, especially you, you see these kids that are turning pro at like 14 and 15 years old. And I'm sorry, I don't think you, you really know what you want when you're, when you're that young. Um, now, I do think there's expectations. You know, I think somebody like Coco Goff, who's obviously so gifted and so talented and has such a love and passion for the game, it's, it's a no-brainer for her to be doing what she's doing. But for somebody that hasn't had those types of results and for somebody that might not be in a position um, where financially they can take on the burden of being a professional tennis player because it's an expensive sport. You know, I think you have to look at other avenues um, to go down because, you know, I think so many parents are like, oh, I want my, my kid to be an Olympian or I want my kid to be number one in the world. And yes. sometimes that's not what the kid wants. Yes. Sometimes it takes a while for the kid to, to realize what they want. And I think college really helps kids kind of realize what they want to do. I mean, I think most um, tennis players, at least that go to college, you know, they, they go off and then they find other things that they love and then they don't end up turning pro. So I think my right. story was unique. I think Jennifer Brady, she's in the semifinals of the U S open. Her story is unique as well. Cause there's not many college players that have, um, you know, reach the levels of success maybe of what we have right. but yeah um, I do think but, college, like going to college and and playing in, in a team setting too you know for other sports in high school and being around other kids um, I think that kind of helps you develop and, and learn more about yourself absolutely I, I do think that we change when once we once we go to college we realize what we really want to do well, yeah. We're going to go to break, Danielle, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the fact that you have rheumatoid arthritis and how you have been dealing with that and can help others. So we'll be right back. Next week, we talk about bullying with actor Sean Kanan, and we talk about breast cancer and getting through it with Baker Jesse Sheehan. Hello all and welcome back to Wake Up With Marcy. I am here with Danielle Collins, 
and you know we were talking about tennis and going pro and also pushing our children and how they develop and maybe change their direction in college. But now I wanna shift gears and talk about rheumatoid arthritis, which you were diagnosed with. So how long did you suffer before you were diagnosed? Yeah, that's a great question. I am not really sure, to be honest. I had symptoms probably starting in my early 20s and you know, always just kind of associated those symptoms with just being injured or being sick or not feeling well and kind of made more sense once I got my diagnosis last year, um, especially with just some of the injuries. Like I had a wrist surgery when I was um, in my sophomore year of college and it was joint related. So I think it, it kind of made sense why I was um, also still continuing to have issues with my wrist after the surgery. For about a right. year after so um yeah and, and then other side effects i had a little bit of hair loss um and that was really difficult for me um especially as you know a young person in college and and not understanding why that was happening but now it, it makes sense <clears throat> so once you were diagnosed which is the testing really difficult is it easy to have that diagnosis um, well, they did a series of different labs, and then they did some scans where they were ultimately able to make the diagnosis um, because of the erosions in my joints. So um, it took a little bit of time. They kind of monitored my bloods over a, probably six months and then made the diagnosis. Okay. So you had to make some real changes in your life. And so how have you dealt with that? And how are you still playing professionally and, and maintaining? Yeah, I think um, the things that have helped me the most are more of the homeopathic things, you know, taking, taking warm Epsom salt baths regularly and the dietary changes. Um, I don't eat um, dairy anymore and I don't, I try to stay away from gluten because those can, you know, trigger an inflammatory response. And, and it's helped me um, keep my, my inflammatory levels down by avoiding those foods that trigger me to flare up. Um, and I also have found a lot of help in acupuncture. I feel like the acupuncture has helped me the most. Um, yeah. Like once I started um, having acupuncture done regularly, um, I started to turn around a little bit more quickly. How did that affect you mentally? Yeah, it was pretty devastating. I mean, at first it kind of felt like a, a death sentence in a way for my tennis career because to have an autoimmune disease like that where it affects every joint in your body and the fear of not knowing what the next steps were, how I was going to respond to treatment, um, it was it was very nerve wracking. I had such a successful year um, in the beginning of last year, and then when I found out that I had rheumatoid arthritis after a long period of time of of feeling very lousy, um, it was yeah, it was very devastating because I I really felt that it was affecting the way that I was playing, and it just seemed like a a hump I couldn't get over. But then um, the beginning of this year, I started off strong. Uh, that was after, you know, three or four months of treatment. And I had some great wins in the beginning of the year and then COVID happened. So that was a bit of a bummer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah. What, what does it feel like for you to be an inspiration to, to young athletes? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to be a positive role model. Um, I know... Um, being only 26 and, and not that far removed from being a kid. Um, so many of the challenges kids face. And I, I also realize now with my rheumatoid arthritis, um, how other people, older people and people my age can relate to me through that. And I hope that I can be somebody that can prove to the world that I can do this, even though I'm living with a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And I think, the understanding of the disease 
and seeing how you have made these changes and you are still continuing as a pro athlete. Um, that's got to be a huge empowerment to others that are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, I mean, I think especially with all of the, with my work-related things, with the travel, with being on the road for long periods of time, with being in a really, in a highly stress, highly stressful um, environment, and, and then the physical side of the tennis, um, being able to recover between matches, and uh, being able to get through training weeks successfully without having any flare-ups, and the way that I've learned to manage um, my RA through my diet, through acupuncture, through treatment, um, I think that that can, that can serve to help a lot of people and what they're dealing with as well, because they might be in a similar situation as me or be dealing with some of the same things. <laughs> so tell me what you would say to a young athlete that is trying to make it really in any sport. You know, I think as corny as it sounds, I think keeping things in perspective and having fun. Because when you're having fun and you enjoy what you do, it makes it that much easier to work hard at something. Um, and I think keeping things in perspective when things don't go your way, um, trying to learn from the adversities, trying to learn from the losses and not taking it as a failure. Um, I think it's so easy when things don't go our way and when we lose to kind of be like, wow, I feel like a failure. How could I lose these matches um, or games or how could I be you know, performing so badly on tests. But I think, yeah, I think just keeping a positive perspective and learning from our mistakes, it's, it's the biggest thing that we can do in our lives that will make us better. And I hear that a lot. It's yeah. very true. Yeah. So, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on Wake Up With Marcy. And I just wish you continued success. I mean, it's just amazing. You go to college you know, number one in Virginia, and then go pro. I mean, how incredible. And you're only 26 years old. So mm. just keep on and keep on inspiring others. Uh, thank you, Marcy. <laughs> All right, Danielle. Bye-bye. All right. Next up, we meet international speaker and author Monica Berg. She is going to discuss the three types of fear and how to identify them and work for them. Next week, we talk about bullying with actor Sean Kanan, and we talk about breast cancer and getting through it with Baker, Jesse Sheehan. Hello all, welcome back to Wake Up With Marcy. We are now going to meet international speaker and author, Monica Berg. Hello, Monica, welcome to Wake Up With Marcy. Thank you, thanks for having me. Uh, I mean, I am so excited to have you on because we are going to be talking about fear, which so many of us are feeling right now for different reasons. But before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about why this work became so important to you. You know, I came into this world um, curious, very curious. And as I looked around me to the adults in my life, um, when I was four, five, six, seven, I started to feel more fear-based and wasn't able to get answers to questions. And more than anything, I noticed that they were really struggling to, to uh, survive, to, to make a living, to be happy. And it was a constant search, right? And I thought, I don't want to live life like that. There has to be a better way. Mm -hmm. So I really started to pursue um, asking questions. And I pursued this as I got older, because at some point in my teenage years, I lost myself. And then I really wanted to rediscover who I was and really decide who I wanted to be. And I realized that fear plays an integral role in our lives. It's there with us for the ride of everything. And you know, when I started to really eradicate fear from my life was after my second son was born with Down syndrome. There was nothing more terrifying for me. I was a young mother. I had another child who was three and a half at the time. And I thought, I am terrified of raising a child with a disability. And I don't know if I can do it. And it awakened a bunch of other fears that I had had in my childhood. 
from when my uncle became schizophrenic, which seemed to happen overnight because nobody was really explaining anything. One day he was normal, one day he wasn't. And in my seven-year-old mind, I thought it was contagious because, you know, it, nobody explained anything. And honestly, if they had, you know, pre-genetic disposition wouldn't have made me feel any more comfortable. Um, I also struggled with anorexia. So I looked at all the things in my life that fear was a companion for. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that what we all fear universally is the fear of the unknown, right? Mm -hmm. But that is what life is. That is the way life is. So once I understood that, then I was really able to face fear head on and and inspire people to not just learn to live with their fear or cope with their fear, but to eradicate fear. So you have found this through your practice in Kabbalah, is that correct? Yes, Kabbalah is actually the wisdom that I discovered when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And that really changed the way that I lived my life. I finally had the answers that I was looking for. I finally understood what, what my purpose was, what the purpose of, um, of life really is, and how you can take any hardship, any chaotic situation or negative situation and see the gift in it. And so that you use it for your growth and for your happiness. And for me, that was very liberating. And it really changed the lens for which I viewed my entire life. So let's talk about a little bit more about children and teens and the fear they face. And as adults, a lot of times we will shelter them or we won't give them a voice. How can we better manage that? And what are the fears that you are seeing teens most face? Well, you know, I really encourage, I have four children, and I encourage them to, if there's something that they're afraid of, let's discuss it, right? I think often we create these fears and they become so big and we keep them secret. And the more you keep something a secret, the bigger it becomes, the darker and scarier it feels. So I first encourage just speaking about it and also understand, and that's why I'm an open book and everything that I write in both of my books and my blog, I write about every experience I've had. I have no shame, none whatsoever, because <laughs> it's not enough for me that I learned from it and that I grew from it. But I, I want people to realize that they can also and that we all are exactly the same. We might have issues in different boxes or buckets, but at the end of the day, we're all fighting the same struggle. So I think that children can be less fear-based depending on how their parents are. I think especially right now during COVID and the pandemic, you know, if, if children look to their parents and they see that they're worried, right? And of course, for many who are struggling financially, I mean, the worry, I understand it's real, or maybe they've lost a job, or they don't have the support system they need, or maybe the marriage is failing. There's a lot of things that this situation has made people kind of face in terms of their lives. But even with that, if you can show your children that you are not afraid, that you will work through it, and of course, you have to have that belief system yourself, but they really respond depending on how we respond. You know, if we, if we are saying, okay, this is part of life and, um, and things will always happen, it goes back to the unknown again. You know, the fact that we never thought this would happen doesn't mean that it never would happen. This is not the first or the last chaotic challenge that the world will see, right? Um, so and, and I really feel like if my, I, and, and I think that's for me when my, when I was younger and I started to be afraid of things, my parents then looked really concerned and worried, which made me even more scared. Like, oh my God, is there something really wrong with me right. that I'm not going to overcome? So fear is not an option. Tell us a little bit about that book. So it is semi-autobiographical. Um, the first part, it just talks about fear and what it is. And it breaks it down because, again, if we break things down into smaller nuggets, then it's easy yeah. to put our head around and say, okay, I can really tackle this. I can, I can see this head on. So I identify three types of fear. There's healthy fear, there's real fear, and there's logical fear. Um, I can go them, through them quickly if you'd like me to. That would be great. Um, so healthy fear is... Um, is something that is set up for our survival and our protection. It's like it sounds. We actually need this fear in our life, right? It's the yeah. thing that you feel if, let's say, you're hiking and you're too close to the edge of a cliff and you get that feeling in your chest or you get a little scared, that warns you to step back, right? It's there to protect you. Or if you're too close to an open flame, again, you're afraid of being burned. But even intuition, um, you know, if you're walking down the street or in a dark alley and you get that weird feeling, you're about to go in an elevator and somebody's in there, right? It's there to say, okay, wait a second, you might be in danger here. So that kind of fear we want to pay attention to. 
Right. Then there is real fear, and that is based in reality. It's fear of death, of sickness, of losing our loved ones. This is a real fear that we do face. But yeah. even with this, it can be transformed to something that can be really powerful. So for instance, if you're afraid to lose your loved ones or your parents, let's say, um, make sure that you spend time with them, telling them how you feel, making sure your time is meaningful and purposeful, that you have no regret. Or if you're afraid of sickness, then make sure you're living a healthy lifestyle, right? Not too much alcohol, not too much sugar, exercise, sleep enough. So that also can be used to help us. And then the last fear is illogical. And that's what really gets us. That's where we spent most of our time. It's fear of heights and spiders and rejection and public speaking. It's anything that our ego is afraid of being attacked. This kind of fear, this is what stops people from living their best lives. It steals their joy. It steals their experience. It steals their purpose. And then you spend so much time in that headspace that you actually miss on, out on the life that you're intended yes. to live. Yes. So that is, and then I take you through all those steps. So that's the first part. The middle part is about my journey through fear. And then the last part takes you through your journey. There's workshops and I take you step-by-step step to really show you how you can eradicate fear from your own life. That's amazing. So just to realize that it does take work to get through these fears and to believe in yourself and love yourself and, and go for things um, and to move past it. So there's no easy fix, but recognizing that we all do have fears, we all live with them, and how we can manage that. And realizing also that whatever we are dealing with, our fears, we are pushing that on, on those around us. So it's really important to really think about that and that you know we are the model for our children. So I really, Monica, thank you so much for coming on and I love your book. How can we find you and find more information on you? So um, both my books, Fears on an Option and Rethink Love are available on Amazon. My blog is um, rethinklife.today and you can follow me on Instagram at monicaberg74. And oh, also my husband and I have a podcast now called Spiritually Hungry, which is available anywhere you listen to podcasts. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for all of the work that you have done and continue to do. And thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Wake Up With Marcy. It was incredible to learn about fear, how we can identify it, work through it, deal with failure, rheumatoid arthritis, so many important subjects. Next week, we talk about bullying with actor Sean Kanan and we talk about breast cancer and getting through it with Baker, Jesse Sheehan. So remember, you can follow me on social media. That's Instagram or Facebook at Wake Up With Marcy. Keep up with the show, who's upcoming, see past shows, and also all information is on my website at Wake Up With Marcy. I want you to also know that I would love to hear from you. So if you have a story idea, or if you see someone doing something kind, or you yourself are doing something kind, I'd love to share about what you are doing to make a difference on my show. All right, have a great Saturday, and I'll see you next week.